When we accidentally flew into some kind of crater in the ground, my crew and I noticed aircraft we had never seen before. Human-like creatures met us, but they seemed much more developed than people. The president has been advised. I am now detained and placed under strict control via the national security provisions of the United States of America. I am ordered to remain silent. These entries from Admiral Richard Byrd's personal diary miraculously leaked into the press in the second half of the 90s. A detailed description of the civilization that lives literally under our feet really shocked society because the records belonged not to some madman, but to a respected American military pilot with numerous state awards. Many questions arise. How could a whole civilization fit underground? Can you trust the words of Richard Byrd? And most importantly, who lives below us? Richard Byrd's claims that he met some mysterious people underground could be considered complete nonsense if there were no examples of such settlements in history. In 1963, a resident of Cappadocia decided to clean up his basement. The man destroyed one of the walls with a sledgehammer and froze in surprise. There was the entrance to a tunnel right in front of him. And when researchers decided to explore it, they found out that the tunnel leads to a mysterious underground city. That's how the settlement of Derinkuyu was discovered. Its tunnel system forms 18 floors and reaches a depth of 85 meters. It's assumed that back in the day, about 20,000 people could have lived in this multi-tiered underground city. Some archaeologists believe that the oldest part of the complex was dug in 2000 BC by Hittites, the people who lived here at the time. Others claim that Derinkuyu was dug by local Christians in the first century AD. One way or another, such a complex structure is undoubtedly the work of real masters. Some underground locations of the city are not only converted caves, but also rooms carved into the soft sandstone. In addition, there are rooms in Derinkuyu for the creation of which it was necessary to process a material resembling granite in hardness. To this day, scientists can't understand how people of that time could cut through so many tunnels without the involvement of technology. There's also a well-designed ventilation system, underground wells, and everything to let people stay underground for a long time. Among the underground city's premises are barns, wineries, and sanctuaries. We can say that life here was even more comfortable than on the surface, and all because Cappadocia has pretty extreme temperature changes. Winters are quite cold, whereas summers are unbearably hot. However, underground, the ambient temperature is constant and moderate. But most likely, the underground city was created to hide from the armies of conquerors. Archaeologists have found huge round stones in the tunnels of the city. It's believed that the locals used them to barricade the entrance to the underground city when outsiders approached Derinkuyu. In addition, the tunnel system here is so intricate that only local residents could figure it out. And if one of the enemies did get into the shelter, they wandered until they died of thirst and hunger. Even modern scientists have only been able to explore 10% of the Derinkuyu underground city so far. But it's not that insignificant when compared to the study of the Egyptian pyramids dungeons. There, the situation is much worse. Even though back in the 1970s, researchers began to map the massive underground complex they discovered in the Memphis area. And in 1994, Egyptian authorities confirmed the existence of underground shelters under the Sphinx. But the ancient Greek travel historian Herodotus wrote about such structures as early as the 5th century BC. Herodotus claimed the Egyptian priests even allowed him to inspect a small part of the infinite lab of Egypt. It was built during the reign of Pharaoh Amenemhat III in the 19th century BC. The labyrinth included one and a half thousand rooms and the same number of underground chambers. Rumor has it that in addition to tombs for 
pharaohs and crocodiles, considered sacred animals. Countless scrolls with secret knowledge are also stored in the dungeon, which should not fall into the hands of ordinary people. That's why the tunnels leading from the Sphinx to the underground part of the Great Pyramid also resemble intertwined lakes. They say that one who got into the dungeon without a special guide, straying through the labyrinths, inevitably found oneself at the entrance again and again. It turns out that people in ancient times could indeed build entire cities underground. However, Richard Byrd wasn't just talking about one settlement. He mentioned an entire underground civilization. But how could it fully accommodate underground? You'll be surprised, but there's a very logical answer to this question. Since ancient times, people have believed there's another world lying under the surface of our planet. But after a while, scientists began to really consider it. In 1692, Edmund Halley, an English astronomer, geophysicist, mathematician, and meteorologist, turned to this topic. Halley put forward the idea that our Earth consists of a hollow shell about 800 kilometers thick two inner shells, and a core. These shells are separated by atmosphere, each with its own magnetic poles. And indeed, if you think about it, the deepest well drilled to date is just over 12 kilometers, and we've never really seen what is deeper, or maybe even who. After all, the most exciting thing is that the scientists believe that Earth was inhabited inside. Although Halley's judgments were ridiculed by the scientific community, in the following centuries, some researchers tried to prove this hypothesis. In 1818, in a letter to Congress, engineer John Cleve Sims wrote that Earth is hollow and inhabited inside. He believed our planet is like a simplified version of Halley's layered model. At the same time, huge openings at the North and South Poles allegedly open access to the hidden world inside. Moreover, it seemed to him that such a model is applicable not only to Earth, but to all planets. And to prove this, he asked Congress for money for the expedition and a hundred escorts. Of course, the authorities didn't give a single cent for research. This hypothesis was virtually forgotten until 1908, when the American writer Willis George Emerson published a book called The Smoky God. The author claims his story is based on a real biography of a Norwegian sea dog named Olaf Janssen. The sailor said that one day, his ship accidentally sailed into an unusual cave in the waters near the North Pole. As it turned out, it led into the bowels of the Earth. After that, the sailor allegedly spent several years with the creatures living in the underground city. Olaf described them as human-like individuals over three meters tall. According to the sailor, this underworld even had its own separate sun. But Olaf's stories are too weak an argument to support the Hollow Earth hypothesis. After all, sailors are famous for their predilection for inventing various fantastic stories that supposedly happened to them at sea. Theories about a hollow earth and people inside sound really crazy, but like legends, they may well carry a piece of truth. What if all this evidence actually corroborates pilot Richard Byrd's notes? Moreover, irrefutable proof of his words has been found in our days and with the help of modern technology. On November 23, 1968, the American spacecraft SS-7 took several pictures of the North Pole in the complete absence of clouds, and a giant black hole is clearly visible on them. The question arises, why has the find not yet been investigated? Moreover, at the moment, any flights over the North Pole, including research satellites, are prohibited. The official version says that these bans are precautionary measures because gravity is weak at the poles, so the force of gravity is unable to hold flying vehicles. But likely, they're just hiding something from the public. Remember how aggressively Congress reacted to Byrd's attempts to discuss his fateful flight? So what was so unusual about what he saw at the North Pole? Admiral Richard Byrd's diary entries dated February 19, 1947, 
seem normal at first. There, the pilot writes that he woke up early and had been preparing for the next research flight over the North Pole from 6 in the morning. Richard was not an ordinary person. He was a member of a noble family from Virginia. Its roots go deep into the 17th century, and it's rumored that members of this bloodline still play an essential role in U.S. government affairs. In addition, he was not just one of the expedition members, but the first person who reached the North and South Poles by air. The famous admiral also had appropriate friends. Edsel and Henry Ford admired their friend's polar exploits so much that they even financed Byrd's expeditions conducted together with the U.S. Navy. The organization of the flight to the North Pole was at a high level and everything seemed to go smoothly. But on that fateful day, sometime after takeoff, Byrd noticed a small oil leak in the engine, after which the plane hit turbulence. The pilot was probably trying to cope with the controls so as not to crash, but instead of falling, the aircraft flew into some kind of cave taking off from it. The pilot and his team saw a mountain range they hadn't noticed before the North Pole during their previous expeditions. And even more so, the researchers didn't expect to see green valleys and forests behind the mountains instead of snow and ice. At one point, Bird realized he didn't see the sun, but at the same time, everything around was illuminated by some unusual light. Further in the diary, it's indicated that the radio and navigational instruments were out of order, and the plane seemed to be circling by itself. When it landed on its own, the team saw strange plants and unusual animals, and some of them resembled mammoths. Bird writes in his diary that some strange flying machines began to approach them after that, and human-like creatures emerged from them. They were tall, with fair skin shimmering with a slight blue-green hue, just like all the local water bodies. These unusual people had white hair and clothes. When they spoke, Bird somehow understood them. They explained to the pilot that he was now underground and invited him to go with them to see how the underground civilization of Agartha lived. People there move on platforms without wheels and live in houses made of crystals, so their city shines and shimmers with all the rainbow colors. In his diary, he repeatedly wrote that he couldn't find words to describe what he saw, but one thing was clear to him for sure. He met a civilization that surpassed ours in the field of science, culture, and technology. The Admiral was invited to the representative of the local authorities, whom he called the master in his diary. He told the pilot that in the past, the Agathari avoided human contact and didn't interfere in their wars, but representatives of the underground were very concerned that the human race had learned to use the power of atomic energy, which wasn't intended for humans. Therefore, after the events in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Agarthians decided to send their aircraft to the surface in order to study people and try to predict their evil intentions. In addition, after 1945, they tried to communicate with people, but were treated with hostility. Now, Bird must convey the warning of the Agarthians to the representatives of his terrestrial civilization, because, according to the underground creatures, they've almost reached the point of no return. When the Agathari helped Bird and his team return to the surface, he immediately documented everything he saw and heard in his diary, and then voiced the message at a meeting in the Pentagon. But the pilot and his crew were strictly forbidden to distribute this information, and Bird, as a professional military man, obeyed the order. Since then, he's been constantly tormented by a secret he couldn't reveal to humanity. If not for the diary's publication after the pilot's death, we would never have known about this incident. But even now, when Bird's notes can be read by anyone, I'm willing to bet that most of you have heard about Agartha for the first time. Moreover, having just learned about it, you're still reluctant to believe in this story, as basically I am. After all, in fact, Bird was a very controversial person. Some believe he not only invented this civilization to interest as many investors as possible, but even falsified his flights to the North Pole. Otherwise, 
Why didn't he take a single photo? Although most sources write that the flights were indeed performed. And during one of the flights, an accident occurred, during which the pilot was poisoned by carbon monoxide and even began to go a little crazy. But what if it was simply advantageous for the U.S. authorities to put Byrd in a bad light? There's only one way to confirm or refute the words of Byrd and his followers to find the entrance to Agartha, pictures of the hole, Halley's hypotheses, as well as the stories of a sailor and a military pilot say one thing. The city may be located at the North Pole. The existence of Agartha just explains all the strange things happening here. For example, researchers note that the temperature increases for some reason as it approaches the poles. This phenomenon is called the Arctic amplification, and one of the first to speak about it was American meteorologist William Sellers in 1969. And in the northern polar region of the ocean, they found plant seeds that seemingly shouldn't be in such a cold place. Moreover, it turned out that icebergs around the North Pole are composed of frozen fresh water, not seawater. In addition, scientists found red pollen of unknown origin on these ice blocks. There's another suspicious fact that some bird species migrate to the north before winter. Why flee from the cold to an even colder place? Usually, ornithologists explain the need for birds to avoid competition for food with other bird species that remain in warmer regions. It sounds a little doubtful, and this is not the last possible evidence that somewhere in the north there may be an entrance to warm areas with abundant vegetation. For example, one can observe the so-called driftwood along the coast of frosty Greenland. These are drifting areas with trees washed ashore on the island. The length of some trees reaches as much as five meters. But where did they come from? The exact same question arises among archaeologists who discovered in the ice on the northern coast of Siberia not only a mammoth, which is natural for this environment, but also an elephant, rhinoceros, hippopotamus, and a lion. These animals can live only in warm regions. And the most interesting thing is that in the stomach of frozen mammoths, they found tropical plants which do not grow in circumpolar regions. It turns out that Agartha could be somewhere nearby with its abundance of animals and vegetation. In addition, this city may have more than one or even two entrances. This became clear thanks to the analysis of many legends about such an underworld, which surprisingly are very similar, although they're found in different countries. For example, in Buddhism, there are stories about a race of superhumans living in the underworld with a capital called Shambhala. This place is only for those people who are pure in heart and have attained enlightenment. The entrance to Shambhala is supposedly located in the mountains of the Himalayan range, but at the same time, it's well hidden. It's believed that you can get there only with the help of meditative practice and the desire for insight. And the Tibetans even call Shambhala the capital of that very Agartha. It's said that the people living there have a scientific knowledge and experience far superior to the knowledge of human beings. That's exactly what Admiral Byrd said. According to some esoteric traditions, Agartha has at least seven entrances. Three of them are in Brazil. The first is in Iguazu Falls, the second is in the state of Mato Grosso, and the third is in the city of Manaus. And in Ecuador, there's a cave which, according to local legends, also leads to a dungeon inhabited by superintelligent creatures. It's located in the city of Cueva de los Tallos, and several metal plates with engravings were found in this 200 million year old cave. Having deciphered these drawings, Hungarian-Argentine scientist Juan Moritz told the local press that he may be called crazy, but he's sure there are higher beings underground. And that's not all. In the Indian city of Varanasi, there's also something resembling a portal to the underworld. This is the Sheshna Well, which the locals consider the entrance to one of the mysterious cities of the world of Agartha, namely Patala. Legends say that it's home to Nagas, amazing, intelligent creatures that can take the form of a person or a reptile. They rarely appear to people and are engaged in the construction of underground cities around the world. 
That's why in India, there's a cult of snakes and dragons. This may be how the Agatharians are seen in India. In any case, it's virtually impossible to verify this. According to legends, descending into the well and plunging into its water, you can see a massive stone door with bas reliefs of cobras which can't be opened. No matter how representatives of different countries and religions call the underworld and its inhabitants, one thing is clear, all these stories couldn't have appeared just like that. And if the inhabitants of the inner earth are so intelligent, they could mask the entrance to their world with the help of unique technologies. But what if it's not we who are really searching, but someone is actually looking for us? American mathematician Martin Gardner claims that our universe is located inside another large hollow world. 